So how can the critical humanities help us address these complex and intertwined dynamics that are shaping our present? And what better place to think about alternative futures than Beirut, where the future keeps increasingly looking more like the past, if not worse? So futures past is a kind of a term that is coined by um, Reinhard Kozelik, the philosopher of history. Um, and futures past as a phrasing kind of carries a strange sense of or a tense of a future anterior, so almost kind of a future that is behind us somehow. Um, Reinhard Kozelik described modernity as the accelerated temporality within which all our horizons of expectation become more and more narrow. There is a kind of a collapsing of distance between our expectations and our experiences in modernity. In other words, we increasingly consider our futures in the ways we have already imagined them in the past. So progress is accelerating towards ends that we somehow can already foresee and predict. And this condition in this account or the modern condition is a condition of being haunted by imagined futures in the past, whereby the future is more of a haunting specter from the past than a possibility of something different. So our present conditions of crisis increasingly look like scenes out of a movie we have watched, dystopias, apocalyptic endings, imminent catastrophes, ecological wastelands, the ruins of civilization as civilization. I think our first speaker, Alenka Zupancic, spent quite some time engaging with this problem, and uh, Françoise Vergès also in her uh, lecture did the same. So the speakers in the series uh, that we have invited um, are invited to address this kind of uncanny temporality, and a Perhaps Professor Cole will come to this from the question of space and spatiality. <laughs> and uh, more crucially, they're invited to do so from Beirut and Lebanon with the hope that what is happening here in our current context does not really become the future past of the world. <laughs> so from this context that we're in, we urgently see the need for futures other than those that have passed. So we're pleased to host today Professor Andrew Cole, who is the Woodrow Wilson Professor of Literature and the director of the Gauss Seminar Series at Princeton. He was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2014, a visiting fellow at All Souls College at the University of Oxford in 2010, a Bloomfield Fellow at Harvard University, a Clark Lecturer at Trinity College, Cambridge University, and visiting professor at the Society for Criticism and Theory at Cornell University. Andrew is a critical theorist and a medieval scholar. His work covers an astounding range of sources, theoretically and historically. He is the author of Literature and Heresy in the Age of Chaucer, uh, came out with Cambridge University Press in 2010. He is the co-editor of The Legitimacy of the Middle Ages on the Unwritten History of Theory with Duke University Press in 2010. He co-edited the Cambridge Companion to Piers Plowman, <laughs> which is, I guess, concerned with alliterations, allegory, satire, all the interesting things <laughs> that, um, yes, and social crisis. So Andrew's most recent book, The Birth of Theory, is particularly intriguing and original. In it, he proposes that Hegel returns in his philosophy to pre-modern dialectics in order to expose the persistence of the pre-modern and the modern condition. And he argues that this move is a site of birth of theory, uh, in contrast to, I guess, a more systematic philosophy. So please join me in welcoming Professor Cole. Very much looking forward to this. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Thank you for coming out on a Friday, no less, at 5 p.m. Um, I will try to make this interesting. I will talk for an hour. I will have a timer on, so when the timer beeps, you can start to feel good about things. Um, that means I will try to wrap up. Um, this is my first time visiting Lebanon. This is my first time in Beirut, and I just wanted to sort of mark that significance um, now in the sense of uh, when I initially received the uh, uh, invitation from Nadia, I, I couldn't have been more eager and enthusiastic to say yes immediately and to come. It turns out I'm finishing a volume that's the sequel to The Birth of Theory, and it's primarily about space. And I've had time to reflect on how certain elements of thought that either has affiliation with the university here or scholars who are Lebanese scholars working, the influence that has had on my own work, and I would just like to name those individuals. So uh, Walid uh, Khalidi, uh, the book All That Remains, I know that he had affiliation with the university here for 
a couple of decades. He had affiliation with my university for a couple of decades. Um, that work, all that remains, the Palestinian vi villages occupied and depopulated by Israel in 1948 has been very uh, instrumental in my thinking, especially in the epilogue where I'm curious about how different aesthetic forms, different media enable the thought of space in a different kind of way. So thinking space linguistically is different from gesturing or inhabiting or moving your body through space, for instance, just to take one example. And the notion of a field study, the notion of talking to elders, the notion of doing archaeological excavation, the notion of being there, which is a different kind of Dasein, um, for me, was very influential and kind of unlocked a lot of what I wanted to think, connecting Hegel to the moment that is contemporary. Um, I don't know if this individual is here, so I don't mean to embarrass you, but if there is a one Mona Fawaz here, um, your thinking has also been uh, important to me in the relationship between uh, abstract forms of spatial thinking in relationship to cognitive thinking and technologies for spatial thinking uh, that we know as GPS software. Uh, and the story case study um, of a delivery driver named Ziad who is quoted as saying, I have a GPS, but in my memory. Uh, and um, uh, Mona and her, if I may, and her co-authors go on to say um, that as uh, Ziad continues his description, it is evident that three years of working on the job have enriched his navigation skills beyond those of a regular GPS system. I find that a very, very interesting suggestion, and it's something exactly what I'm looking for at a moment when technologies take over the process of thought for us. At the moment where, who remembers a phone number anymore? They're all in your cell phone, right? Um, who knows how to really cognitively map? Uh, GPS software does a great job of that. We don't need to think space anymore. I find that a very curious uh, tension. I find it a very intriguing uh, atrophy of certain uh, spatial faculties that we have cognitively. And I just wanted to uh, say a word of thanks uh, for that contribution to scholarship, too. And then finally, there is an American uh, uh, Lebanese author named um, Anthony Shadid, uh, who uh, has, a, has a book called uh, The Stone House. And it's about trying to uh, recover his maternal grandfather's house that was destroyed in southern Lebanon. And he wants to go there. It's this kind of like really kind of crazy story about multiple stonemasons coming in, finding things hidden in the walls, and just also a recount of, of, of um, less than space, but more about place and dwelling and the meaning of place and locality. And how can that be recovered? How that can be uh, reconstructed? Um, there too are interesting proposals about the relationship between, again, as I will talk about here and repeat kind of ad nauseum, how certain media are produce a different kind or thought about space. Um, his interesting contribution is about space and accenting that they're at different locations. There are different people speak different accents, which is a particularization of language. I find useful versus the generality of language as a structure, as a universal, et cetera, et cetera, as something that's the subject of linguistics say, right? And so this would sort of do, it's a sort of like a reverse Derrida, prioritizing speech um, over language, okay? So I just wanted to uh, make those uh, things clear. And, it, and it's, so it's really wonderful to sort of think with these authors. Um, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to be with you. Um, so again, when I say thank you for coming on on a Friday, I really do mean it. Um, so, reaching for my timer, I uh, will start in on a uh, talk called Asymmetries. Um, Asymmetry names several different problems ranging from the social to the political to the natural to the metaphysical. We often hear the term in reporting about asymmetrical warfare or in discussions about economic or educational inequalities of the uneven distribution of wealth and resources, of how many individuals labor the hardest for how long, depleting their bodies for wages that are unlivable, unsustainable. Asymmetry, it seems, evokes matters of inequality in a distinctly spatial way. 
The manner in which asymmetry invites one to picture or even visualize in an illustration, say, proportions relative to others. Asymmetry, this is to say, involves several modes of aesthesis, different kinds of experiencing, and accordingly enters into the academic disciplines in ways that are themselves asymmetrical in institutions of higher learning that are disproportionately skewed toward the study of the safe and the same, if not at the level of primary education in my country, the study of the false, or in the case of my own country again, of pseudo-national histories of slavery, uh, of whitewashed histories of, of terror against black folk that are whitewashed for the sake of a quote-unquote fair and balanced presentation in the TV news. In a stricter disciplinary sense, in say the discipline of architecture, to continue on with our spatial theme, asymmetry concerns design or structural elements that do not mirror one another, but can achieve visual balance and the right disparity of volumes, thus expressing a certain dynamism between elements, a more alive design that isn't inert seeming or rotely repetitious. More at the level of the everyday, our built environment, the terrain on which it is grounded is through and through uneven and asymmetrical from soil compositions to elevations that we level and terraform in our constructions and desire for levelness, smooth planes and surfaces, a desire all the more acute when there is unevenness under our feet. And so we still walk or otherwise locomote across terrains that strain our legs or as abilities vary, strain our arms, experiencing an embodied relationship to underlying asymmetries in place that are fashioned by whomever built our world, shaping our perceptions and indeed our lives through deep and not so deep infrastructures often put into place from generations on end, or for that matter, imposed by occupying forces and settlers. There isn't a place in the world where asymmetry doesn't matter, which is why in the case of climate science, it's necessary to formulate nonlinear mathematical models to try and discern the relation between inputs and outputs that will produce unpredictable and asymmetrical impacts across the globe that fall and will continue to fall along lines of economic class, race, and region. But why stop here in this thought of asymmetry? Why stay at the level of the planetary? You're free to raise this problem to the cosmos. How dare we not reach or dream and contemplate with the disciplines of particle physics, the asymmetry between matter and antimatter, between that is baryonic and antibaryonic matter, there being more matter than antimatter, as well as more neutrinos than antineutrinos in the universe as we currently know it. This particular asymmetry, far below our noses in which matter prevails, explains why there exists anything at all, though of course we may never answer what came before. Clearly and perhaps breathlessly, the fact of asymmetry intrigues me and in a more boring way, it fascinates me because it connects many disciplinary practices in critical theory, philosophy, intellectual history, empirical sciences, the arts, the study of human culture, and the praxis necessary to help and heal ourselves, if not our world. Now, coming off of that, I would like to make this deflationary claim that asymmetry intrigued the philosopher Hegel like no other thinker. And this is revealed in the very construction of his dialectic as an inherently spatialized logic that helps us first name these asymmetries, then think them, and then make a politics out of them. Now, whether we can call all of these aforementioned asymmetries in my overture dialectical, that's one thing, and results may vary. But what can be said is that Hegel's dialectic is the preeminent form and exemplary logic of asymmetry. Hegel examines asymmetries across the staggering range of his work on architecture, sculpture, painting, music, poetry, history, politics, natural science, religion, and philosophy. And in fact, his understanding of contradiction is itself a signal instance of asymmetrical relationality, whereby opposition, that sort of binary opposition, is never even Stephen, never 
as we say, six of one and half dozen of another, never perfectly opposed polarities, but always a lopsided and uneven affair. Hegel's Lord Bondsman or so-called master-slave dialectic is just one example of this asymmetry. Asymmetry itself is not exactly a term Hegel repeats a lot, so much as he criticizes symmetry and enjoys speaking of symmetries that are only symmetries in name, as if almost in a game of gotcha, chuckling every time a symmetry, that is, a symmetry, falls apart. We can observe, above all, that Hegel decided that symmetry and asymmetry has most to do with architectures and questions of the built environment. Take his aesthetics, for instance. Hegel establishes architecture as primarily or ideally an art of symmetry, or more specifically, the relations of symmetry among masses and volumes. But in saying so, he set himself up for the task of showing how a given symmetry undoes itself in both architectural design and in the dynamic between architecture and other arts that support architecture, like sculpture, and indeed in the tensions between architecture and habitation, or architecture and use, or theory and practice, and generally between architecture and this thing we call life. Art, in fact, for Hegel is ever in tension with symmetry and seeks to escape it, even if at moments it falls back into symmetry, which is why he says that, quote, the ideal work of art must rise above the purely symmetrical. So it's not art if it's symmetrical. In terms of architecture in Hegel, we find that the more architecture there is, the more building there is, the more that symmetry comes under strain as the built environment accumulates into a more complex and embroidered totality, open to unpredictable, unintended, and undesigned kinds of relationality involving a range of practices and purposes, like sculpture and the other arts, like music, painting, and poetry. How can we think a spatial dialectic in these terms and not bother ourselves so much with the familiar dialectic of so many garden variety philosophies of history that hasten you on from thing to thing? In other words, how can we think a spatial dialectic instead of the dialectic that we're used to thinking, which is the temporal dialectic? The dialectic where you just kind of wait around, bide your time, and then stuff happens. Hegel mostly talks about symmetry as a process of emergent asymmetry, or an afflosung, a dissolution of symmetry into asymmetry, demonstrating the limits of symmetry and the undoing of symmetry in relation to what's built or what's embodied, what's constructed and what's extensive. And so to my mind, this means that he aims to represent or even figure dialectics in an especially capacious way. Figure dialectics in the sense of those moments where he wants to make his dialectical thinking clear by other means than just saying, I'm doing dialectics. So for example, uh, very much within his writing, he speaks about the shapes or gestalten of the dialectic which I believe is a spatializing gesture on his part. There are many examples like this that challenge our habits to think of the dialectic in only temporal or even linguistic terms. The problem, in other words, is not that you do dialectics and for your misdeeds take careful notes on an excruciating line of thinking in such complex texts like the phenomenology of spirit. Rather, it's that you step away from texts step away from timelines, quit logophilia, to instead see, feel, sense, and touch what is inherently concrete and contradictory about our world as a built environment and ponder how we can develop a corresponding theory of place, a dialectic of space. So this section is called cities. Now, a dialectic of space worth its weight must account for the problems, struggles, contestations, erasures, and indeed asymmetries of the built environment. 
And so we will work our way to these problems by asking what it means to represent the built environment at all. How narration, or rather language, picks out space and place, how it brings into reference infrastructures and structures, and how in the discipline of literature or the literary arts, the novel form emerges as a potentially privileged genre insofar as it is a registration device for spatiality itself. Here I am thinking of the novel as a technology of space, if you will, that indexes the built environment rather than only indexing time. I begin with the Nigerian American author Teju Cole, a thinker, no relation by the way, but a thinker keenly attentive to social and economic asymmetries and the problem of race, space, migration, and the crossing of borders. Teju Cole's Open City, a novel published in 2011, follows Julius, a Nigerian immigrant in his final year of his psychiatry fellowship, sauntering around New York City in the mode of a classic nightly constitutional, or in other words, walking therapy, seeking to get out for some fresh air and to clear his head from his daily cares. He moves with varying degrees of attentiveness, perception, and involvement in his surroundings and calls his perambulations aimless wandering. Much of what I was doing uh, downtown, by the way. In the following quotation, and this is the first one, first one on the handout, which uh, purportedly exists. <laughs> um, but this is the first quotation if, if folks want to share um, or just sit back and relax and I'll try to read it out in story time fashion. We will join Julius at a particular place in the novel. After hanging out at the intersection of Albany and Washington streets in lower Manhattan, he finds his way onto Vesey Street, pressed on by a crushing crowd of professionals leaving work. Going with the human flow, he comes upon the location of the former World Trade Center buildings after the event of September 11, 2001. He looks down into the enormous empty pit that he names a construction site and shares these thoughts. And now finally, this is the handout. This was not the first erasure on this site, quoting Teju Cole now. Before the towers had gone up, there had been a bustling network of little streets traversing this part of town. Robinson Street, Lawrence Street, College Place. All of them had been obliterated in the 1960s to make way for the World Trade Center buildings and were all forgotten now. Gone to was the old Washington market, the active piers, the fishwives, the Christian Syrian enclave that was established here in the late 1800s. The Syrians, the Lebanese, and other people from the Levant had been pushed across the river to Brooklyn where they'd set down roots on Atlantic Avenue and in Brooklyn Heights. And before that, what Lenepe paths, these are Amerindians, these are indigenous folk who lived in the region, uh, what Lenepe paths lay buried beneath the rubble. The site was a palimpsest, and palimpsest is going to be a word I'm gonna do something with here in a minute. The site was a palimpsest, as was all the city, written, erased, rewritten. There had been communities here before Columbus ever set sail, before Verrazano anchored his ships in the Narrows or the black Portuguese slave trader Esteban Gomez sailed up the Hudson, human beings had lived here, built homes and quarreled with their neighbors long before the Dutch ever saw a business opportunity in the rich furs and timber of the island and its calm bay. Generations rushed through the eye of the needle and I, one of the still legible crowd, entered the subway. I wanted to find the line that connected me to my own part in these stories. So here's me again. Seeing past constructions and destruction, discovering quite how many memories are contained in what's erased as something else, as something new is being raised, or being erected, being constructed, the so-called Freedom Tower that stands now in downtown New York City, Julius contemplates accumulations of histories, any one of which could take a lifetime to know well or study. There's a single image in this passage that captures a multiplicity here on Vesey Street, and that's the image of the palimpsest. 
The site was a palimpsest, as was all the city, written, erased, rewritten, unquote. This, the palimpsest is a very easy textual metaphor, and in other work I have cautioned against such metaphoricity in cases where it leads to the hasty textualization of space, rendering the spatial and the material into a linguistic and temporal form in the face of its hard and intransigent materiality that concretizes the past in a very persistent way. In other words, the medium matters here when we remember that the very idea or problem of the palimpsest comes not from the age of linguistics, lexicography, and universal grammars, nor from the suburban American moment of three-hole punch notebook paper for your groovy mead trapper keeper. Rather, the palimpsest results from the practices of writing on surfaces like stone and dried animal skin on which someone has already written and whose text, whose work you erase through manual pressure through the violence of taking a chisel or a blade to the material itself to scrape away the writing and overlay your own. But you can only do so much erasing and rewriting without destroying the writing surface itself. The idea being that the underlying matter can only take so much digging in or erasure. Put in these material terms, the medium is not a hard drive on your computer because it resists overwriting. The palimpsest pushes back until it gives in, which means that the medium typically preserves what's erased, even if only as a faint, illegible trace, in what I think is an example of Hegelian sublation or Aufhebung. There's a whole footnote here about Aufhebung in relationship to architecture. If uh, you want to hear about that, uh, just ask me. What's past as old writing is very much present, very much there in the material. It's a notion of the past that is not as some idea you vaguely entertain about history or a factoid you read in a printed history book, but rather to amplify Teju Cole's point, it's history or the past as an accretion in the built environment itself and what can be named and what I would like to name after Hegel, a material contradiction. So that's one of the things that interests me so, you know, if you just want to write words down, we got palimpsest, <laughs> we have material contradiction, and we can just leave it at that, right? We're done. That's it. The term material contradiction uh, can be helpful in recognizing the material dynamics and torsions between what lies beneath and what gets dignified by the term surface and what gets demeaned by the term depth and all that is presented to us as appearance. Every city expresses these material contradictions and it doesn't take the destruction of a building to think them or in the meaning of aesthetics offered by Freud in his essay on the uncanny to feel them. Instead, it takes many things, many approaches, many feelings addressing the total sensorium and all that falls under aesthesis. So more on that point as we move along. Meanwhile, let me approach the problem of thinking or representing a city in another way, this time looking at a passage that doesn't overtly portray a site as a palimpsest, but implies such a construction in any case in its depiction of a city space more generally. I am thinking of Haruki Murakama's novel 1984, which on the cover is printed as 1Q84, published in 2009. Now we're in Tokyo, Japan. Early in the novel, we find the main character, Aomame, as she abruptly exits a taxi and descends a precarious, descends a precarious emergency staircase, going from a congested elevated highway to the street level in the city. She pauses and experiences her surroundings in the following all-encompassing way. And this is, should be the second quote on your handout, I think. The din of the city enveloped her. Car engines, blaring horns, the scream of an automobile burglar alarm, an old war song echoing from a right wing sound truck, a sledgehammer cracking concrete. Riding on the wind, the noise pressed in on her from all directions. Okay, that's the end of the quote. So the thing about this passage is that everything 
goes together so expectedly, so naturally, everything retailed with equal force, with every aural element said to affect Aomami from all directions. I mean, this is like what you see in novels. Like you read a novel, you see this, you read this. This is what is, right? Oh, it's a city. This passage uh, reads not like a palimpsest so much as maybe a noise collage. It's an aural surface, that is to say. It is not a dimensionalized, it is not a dimensionalized aural word image of the city because there is no verbal sense of any sound or noise being closer or farther than the other, louder or quieter, ranging in this or that frequency. Words work here. Again, words do their work here, yet they fail, yet they don't work. Language succeeds by failing, if you'd rather think of it that way. It's all here, registering what it takes not only to figure somehow the built environment where space plus language reduces language to enumeration and indices, the sheer listing of details. Rather, it is also a passage that invites us to question its very possibility. Like, how can you write a sentence like that? Just what are the conditions of possibility for writing a sentence like that? What we have here in this catalog of noise, in other words, is an allusion to complex historical processes and likewise an accumulation of pasts. Each item listed in this passage presupposes whole histories of technology, equipment, transportation, politics, war, infrastructure, materials, science, and as the common denominator, capitalist progress. Most of these developments happen by accident, by fits and starts, by interlocking intentions, by someone's plan A meeting someone's plan B, by competing copyrights and patents, by diverse approaches to production, all in totality that no single person could witness, no single sentence could capture, much less a single word like city or den could convey. If centuries of historicism have taught us anything, it's that writing and history, sentences and events are never a perfect match. And city novels intensify this problem of representation because they are sites for a language practice that is thoroughly conventional, as in this example, yet rather unbelievable when you really start to reflect on all that needs to happen in time, history, and place for a simple sentence like that one to be imagined and then legible. The passage in Murakami, in other words, gets at this idea or even problem that the city, as an intensified and layered example of the very meaning of the built environment, is a haphazard accumulation of praxes, erasures of praxes, and immense complexes of material forces drawn into a mass whose shape and dynamics no one can completely know in advance or describe at any given moment using whatever linguistic means are at their disposal. Even planned cities exceed their plan in this respect, and always famously they do. And of course, what's now known as world cities are so extensive and unbounded as to escape comprehension and visualization. All of these accidents of history and human habitation add up to a sum, an accumulation, greater than the individual parts. Yet here we have our breezy, novelistic sentence by Murakami, where everything just goes together and you read on. It's curious that you can find this problem of representation in most of the great so-called city novels, with, say, uh, Eugène Sue's Les Mystères de Paris, of 1842 to 43, extending all the way to Murakami's, Murakami's 1984. Novels which are almost always a thousand pages long or more, and yet still in their portrayal, they come up short in their depiction of urban space, only to be able to depict the city metonymically and serially by parts like the rooftops, the noise, the street, and so forth. But the problem isn't only about cities or long novels, even if we should view the city as an intensification of problems of the built environment seen everywhere else. If you think, for example, of Sarah Broom's lovely novel published in 2019, The Yellow House, you quickly find that the problem of language persists at a very local level, where in a new kind of poetics of space, 
You can only dream about touching your former devastated house. The eponymous yellow house in an African-American neighborhood utterly wrecked by the hurricane named Katrina. You can only have dreams of knocking on the door of the destroyed house, feeling in your dreams the material resistance of the door on your knuckles, which makes the problem of writing about the house rather an interesting proposition when words don't seem to be enough. The author, Sarah Broom, writes, and this is the third quotation, Daryl's house of five children made me think of the yellow house. During the night, I dreamt of it for the first time in five years. I was at the locked front door attempting to bang it down. Bam, bam, bam was the sound I made, but it didn't yield. In the dream, the weight of the door hurt my hand too much to keep going. The next morning, I woke exhausted and wrote the following in my notebook. How to resurrect a house with words. End quote. Within the space of Daryl's house, Sarah wakes up to write about how hard it is to write. Realizing that this house is materialized now only in a dream. Sound, gravity, heaviness, weight, the unyielding door, physical pain, all of which comes first and ends in the question how to resurrect a house with words. Yes, there are words here, but words yearning for other ways to access this space, this old space, this destroyed space, this former house, using other media and other modes. To speak of media is to take some fundamental insights from media theory. It is to propose that this very problem of representation could be specified as an asymmetry between different media, a contradiction between language and what's not language, and all that counts as the nonverbal, solidified, materialized, concretized facticities of human habitation, or what Jean-Paul Sartre would call in his critique of dialectical reason, the practico inert. By this phrase, the practico inert, Sartre means the sedimented praxis of our surroundings that we confront in our daily routines and which constrain our activities. For example, you have to wait in line for the bus this way if the bus ever arrives. You have to walk down the alley that way, but around this pothole or tree. Why is this wall here? And who pitched the steps so steeply and so forth? Turns out the existentialist framework applies not only to people getting in your face and hellishly interfering with your own quote unquote project, as Sartre calls it, it also applies to people in the past doing the same thing with the structures they built and left behind for you to encounter, negotiate, and confront. What's the point? It's that space isn't only a problem of language, even if it's a problem for language. There is a full sensorium involved, and the analysis of space demands something more of us. It requires that we not so hastily transform space into language as if language and space are adequate to one another, even if it is deeply curious that the failure of language itself is often spatialized as a gap in the symbolic or the eruption of the real, like some mythical leviathan breaking the surface of the symbolic. Or even if, I may go on to say, that it's doubly curious that for Derrida, spacing marks the moment of a new era of legibility for text. All of this means, too, if there's a way to make a problem even more grandiose, that we must not temporalize space as if space and time are the same and interchangeable and thus somehow equally absolute as Francis Newton mistakenly believed. They are not, not even in space time. The problem is to approach space through a variety of media, some better adapted to spatiality than others. If there is a point to even talking about the range of media at our disposal in spatial analysis, it's to say that each form or mode presupposes a kind of relating to space that is necessarily distinct from another medium. That thinking space with language is different from thinking space with images or with dreams or with your body or with whatever ability or even just moving through place. There are too many contradictions in space and place to rely on just one mode, one approach. This section is called heterotopia.
What Teju Cole and Haruki Murakami ha are, are exemplifying, what they are showing us in their descriptions of New York City and Tokyo, respectively, is perhaps a notion of heterotopia, which is often a term you hear to characterize urban spaces as contradictory and multiply determined, as historically sedimented and as accretions of human praxis. Andreas Huizen, in his book, Present Past, kind of interesting cut across the, the, the theme, uh, in his book, Present Past, writes that, quote, the strong marks of present space merge in the imaginary with traces of the past, erasures, losses, and heterotopias. Just let that float. We, we, we won't really worry about that one so much. It's the notion of heterotopia that we're after. Even earlier, Michel Foucault, in his venturing into spatial conceptions, in a well-known lecture called Of Other Spaces, which he wished were, was not circulated, <laughs> proffered an idea of heterotopia that is, in his words, quote, capable of juxtaposing in a single real place several spaces, several sites that are in themselves incompatible, unquote. Foucault's formulation initially seems like a promising line of inquiry that can help us say something else, maybe something more about Teju Cole's palimpsest that is New York City. Furthermore, it seems promising when Foucault boldly declares that, quote, the present epoch will perhaps above all be the epoch of space. We are in the epoch of simultaneity. We are in the epoch of juxtaposition, the epoch of the near and far, of the side by side, of the dispersed, unquote. But I have to say there's a modicum, a small amount of disappointment in Foucault or um, in Foucauldianism sort of circling around the problem of built environments. To begin with, Foucault wants to preserve his idea of the site in the discursive sense as what is produced by institutions and as what disciplines subjects within regimes of power. In other words, he aims to separate the analysis of discursive or institutional sites from the material sense of a site as a place. And he does this even while at the very moment he's developing his tantalizingly entitled Archaeology of Knowledge in a book by that name. This division between discursive sites and material sites perhaps leads Foucault into a contradiction himself. He says, that is, that sites are not superimposable. For him, a site can be reduced to another site. There can be no two sites in one place, no two things in one space. And we'll return to that notion. For him, there can be no two things in one place. Sounds, sounds reasonable, actually, right? It is true in the same essay, he thinks more experimentally about a certain place called heterotopia within which Superimposition seems at least conceivable or at the very least given to spatial experience. So maybe you can have multiple things in one place. His example is the theater in which an audience encounters a variety of superimpositions or in his words, superimposed meanings. That is playgoers bring together various spatial conceptions. For example, the sensation of being in a brick and mortar theater house or just being in a room. Um, the experience of the imagined space, that is, the stage, and the various scenes, one after another, produced with a simple modification of lighting, or the hanging of a drape, or the introduction of a stage prop, and so forth. All matters that Bertolt Brecht himself understood well, by the way. In talking about spatial meanings here, however, Foucault encounters a limit in just how a heterotopia may be more than imaginary, to cite Poison's incomplete formulation, more than just matters of meaning and imagination. Foucault forecloses the possibility of a heterotopia as actually existing in the built environment, that is, as a materiality unto itself. Okay, so what comes after Foucault, right? Uh, Hegel. So this section is called Hegel. So leave it to the idealist Hegel to do the work of a materialist in conceptualizing place as a site of superimposition, place as the location of a materiality at odds with itself in its multiplicity. How does Hegel come to this conclusion? 
The answer begins with understanding that Hegel sought to recuperate the philosophical category of contradiction, to bring it back to philosophy after centuries of thinkers expunging it from the philosophical process up to and including Immanuel Kant. Hegel instead wanted to state that contradiction constitutes not only our habits of thought and perception, but as well our modes of being in the world, even the feeling of life, especially in moments of pain. Quote, contradiction cannot be thought, Hegel writes in the science of logic, but in the pain of the living being, contradiction is an actual concrete existence, unquote. Contradiction and pain, contradiction and embodiment. So contradiction already isn't only for thinking, it's for feeling, it's for embodiment by the living being. Contradiction, as Hegel poses it here, is already actual, already concrete, concrete, which is a term referring not to cement, but to the idea that what is whole, complete, and total is nonetheless riven with differences, which, to come full circle, such an idea of an existent or material contradiction already expresses. So we're getting to this notion of a material contradiction, not a temporal contradiction, but a material one that constitutes, I don't know, a philosophy of nature. It helps to sort of follow Hegel and what he writes after the phenomenology of spirit, namely the science of logic, as we already had seen, and then a little later on his philosophy of nature. The new developments in these texts are that contradiction, and these are basically his words. I know I keep saying, you know, just because you say it doesn't make it so. I'm saying what Hegel says, and then we can talk about what that means. But Hegel says that contradiction is real, actual, and existent such that it can be said that in a fundamental way, contradiction constitutes the material environment, not only in the buildings we build, uh, as in my opening to this paper, but that contradiction is a feature of matter itself, rife with difference before we even, to sh before we even seek to shape matter into a second nature through our labor. But what I have said here isn't really the hard part. This might be a good time to go to the bathroom or, or take a nap, uh, and then I can, I'll, 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 I'll pound the table when it's time to, 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 to uh, wake up and follow along. Um, rather, the difficulty comes in a series of formulations where Hegel more than ever flouts the laws of logic, the very principles of philosophy since Aristotle, and boldly Hegel says that two things or more can be in the same place at the same time. This logical oddity, which supplies a new jolt to the very idea of contradiction, which now is such a boring word, we need to get the feeling back. You know what I mean? Contradiction needs to mean something. Um, it needs to be made uh, astonishing. It needs to give us pause. It needs to make us tarry, to slow down time, to stop in the immediate, in the moment of immediacy long enough to apprehend mediation long enough to study the mediate in its emergence. Yes, this logical peculiarity is expressed in his treatment of matter. And a few points here before giving you just one of the many instances. So for Hegel, matter has a peculiar spatiality. Hegel finds that the quality of elasticity above all captures the spatial peculiarities of matter, and lacking later knowledge about electron fields and repulsive forces at the, elect at the atomic level, he is nonetheless intrigued by instances when objects are microscopic microscopically in contact with one another with varying degrees of force and pressure. In most cases, objects bend and flex in contact with each other, and objects accordingly revert to their ideal shape. You know, there we go, uh, revert to their ideal shape when the contact force or pressure ends, much in the way a pillow made out of that memory foam, you know, that much like one of those pillows bounces back into shape when uh, you raise your head from the pillow. Elasticity runs the range of tensions and of course has limits until things break, but it's in this thought this thought of the volume dynamics of matter that Hegel offers his strange and shocking idea in the philosophy of nature. 
He says that the elasticity of which all matter partakes activates a simultaneity within matter itself that keeps matter together, that helps an object remain cohesive, keeping it whole by the force of the paradoxical unity of parts. And this is that quotation. It's uh, the one that says on the sheet, two material parts which formerly persisted as outside of each other and which must therefore be conceived as occupying different places in the object now occupy one and the same place. This is the contradiction and it exists here in a material form. So that's crazy talk, um, but this is the philosophy of nature. And I guess that's where you do your crazy talking. We finally find a symmetry, we, in other words, finally find symmetry, fusion, a convergence of two material parts at the heart of matter that consequently reverberates asymmetry up the material order in the way some things break and some things fall apart. You may wonder why Hegel speaks only of two material parts in one place. Very, very pressing matter, right? Um, the limit should be addressed um, the limit of two, only because in the foregoing analysis of novels and built spaces, we had been looking at the plurality of place as containing many parts, many determinations, many properties, many inertias, and many praxes. So why just two? Hegel speaks of the two that are in one in the same place because he aims to contest the iron law that is the principle of non-contradiction which has been used over the millennia to say that two things cannot be in the same place at the same time. This law of non-contradiction has long been associated with Aristotle, who in his metaphysics asserts, quote, this is not on the handout. The most certain of all basic principles is that contradictory statements are not at the same time true. In other words, you can't say A is B and A is not B, with both being true at the same time. But Hegel is doing exactly that in his formulations, especially in a curious one in the science of logic, which we won't look at. Hegel said pishaw to all of these laws of logic to give us a sense of a more disordered, even if dialectical world. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, I have my person to focus on. <laughs> So a, a final takeaway here uh, is that Hegel, in my view, uh, does all this rethinking not to only intensify the notion of contradiction, extending it from thought to matter itself, but to redefine the very meaning of place itself. This is all in the name of defining what is place, right? And this is all also a way of engaging in Aristotle, who only wanted to think of space in relationship to place. Place is the common term in all of Hegel's discussion of spatial paradoxes and material contradictions. And he has many of them, uh, sororities, uh, paradoxes involving, you know, uh, the field that at one point is a field, but now it's a forest because it has one extra tree. Or, you know, the man who is bald because he lost that last hair and is now bald. I can't remember how long ago that was, but I've, it's been a while. Uh, but those kinds of things, these sort of uh, spatial paradoxes that are about places, sites, fields, and such like. Place is that common term. Um, and it matters in that place can contain the contradictions of place or of matter itself and hold multiple determinations together, even if contradiction is beneath our notice or doesn't immediately enter our thoughts as we look upon the world. Indeed, the only thing that you can say in advance about place is that it is contradictory, which means, and Hegel realizes this, that picking out a place and thinking of it in singular, easily definable terms is an impossibility, both philosophically and practically. So in other words, anyone who is saying that place is not multiply determined, that place does not have more than two things in one place, that person is the one who's being illogical, right? So that's how he wants to have it. And I find that a very useful formulation for thinking about the built environment and of thinking about what we might call a dialectic of space. So let's see where this goes. I'm, I'm, I'm making some cuts here because I want to get to Marx. Um, let's see where, let's see where it goes. Um, 
I would claim then this formulation that Hegel is a, is, is a founder of dialectical materialism, and I know that other of my friends have done this, but I don't like their formulation, and I like mine better. But um, <laughs> that was a very academic and well-supported argument. See, that's that's how you make a philosophical demonstration. Uh, you just say, you know, screw Slavoj. Um, <laughs> are you getting that at home? Anyway. Um, Hegel was the founder of a kind of dialectic materialism, something like a science of the dialectic that dares venture into the philosophies of nature as much as the philosophies of history. It's odd, namely, because that distinction goes to Marx, or at least to his reception across the decades after his death, beginning with Engels and his work, The Dialectics of Nature, which my professors always told me, don't read that. And it's like, okay, you just, it's like, are, are you over 18? Click, you know, I mean, it's just the, <laughs> I'm clicking. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going in. I'm going in. Uh, but credit can still go to Marx retrospectively, even if we appreciate just what Marx got from Hegel on this theme of spatial paradox, which is, I suggest, that Marx made the Hegelian notion of material contradiction of two things being in the same place into a central idea of his theory of the commodity. Readers may remember that Marx says that the commodity is a twofold thing a use value and an exchange value. And I argue that he challenges us to think this twofold thing as two bodies in one place, that is within one extension. And any readers who suffered through my previous book, The Birth of Theory, can find my argument there that this twofold thing, this strange contradiction that is the commodity, is a material contradiction that is concealed in the English translations of use value and exchange value. So here again is another example of language not doing the work of space. It's just failed translation, but let's just blame language anyway, right? Um, and this is these words I have on the handout. In Marx's own language, talking about the commodity, Warenkofe, is the term for use value or better use body. And Wertkofe or value body or the embodiment of value is the term for exchange value. Here is the twofold thing, then, where two bodies or a corpora can exist in the same portion of space within the same extensio. It is true that the usual reading is to view use value as matter, as the thing that you can touch, and exchange value as an abstraction, so that there aren't any logical problems of two things occupying one space, and Aristotle is all happy in his grave, but Marx too frequently insists on congealed, substantialized, crystallized, materialized aspects of exchange value to permit us to adopt for very long that distinction between what's actual and what's abstract, what's real and what's ideal. In fact, it's what's actual and what's actual, and it's our problem to sort of deal with it, and the way we deal with it, and this is the explanation, is in fetishism. <laughs> To the degree that the commodity is the emblem for capitalism writ large, explaining why Marx even begins capital with an analysis of commodities in the first place, its material contradiction after Hegel must be understood to represent or indeed reflect the spatial paradoxes or indeed dialectical difficulty within the larger capitalist mode of production itself that would, as time would tell, envelop every way of life on the globe. And what does a commodity represent now in global capitalism but a multifold, multidimensional thing of many places and the way in which its movement within the circuits of production and consumption, in other words, its circulation, is congealed within the commodity as if it were a monad that captures all far-flung relations together within itself. If the commodity is the sign for something or a thing hewn from hard reality, it's this quality as a twofold thing whose substance is abstract labor spatialized over the globe. The commodity is a figure for spatial paradox as well as spatial abstraction in that it obfuscates those circuits, territories, and vistas over which commodities must traverse to accrue value. The spaces over which they must travel propelled by fossil fuels to combine with other commodities in the assembly of durable or not so durable goods by the labor of modern low wage work or even slavery, slaves. 
How far we want to go in this broad spatial conception of the commodity depends on how coextensive the place of our dwelling is within the space of the commodity. How comfortable we are with feeling commodified, with feeling objectified. How commodified in the broadest sense possible we feel we are and how we feel our spatial conceptions are already the product of capital. Just what is the actual place of the commodity when it appears not to be delineated only by its own extension or objectness, its own thingliness in space, but rather projects itself, its space, it projects its space and takes within itself the spatialities of its own globalized mode of production. I mean, if you think about the thought of all the kind of the, the assembly of something like an iPhone, uh, uh, that's a product of Apple, which is a which is an American company with products, you know, with with materials that are mined and from West Africa and assembled by Chinese laborers either in West Africa or in China itself, and then the transportation of these dev devices, you know, um, in container ships and just the kind of networks that bring these things together. You have to ask where is a commodity? What is the kind of location of the commodity? Asking the question the other way around, not that it's in my hand, but something of the world of production is within the thing itself. Now, this problem of the twofold commodity calls for a new discipline called doppel urbanology. So before I define that crazy Germano Greek English word, which is not mine, uh, let's pick back up with Mirakami's 1984 and Aomami in the city again when she's leaving the cab to descend the scarily difficult stairs to make it to street level. Okay, this is one of the quotations. There is always, as I said, one reality, the cab driver repeated slowly, as if underlining an important passage in a book. Of course, Aomami said. He was right. A physical object could only be in one place at a time. Einstein proved that. Reality was utterly cool-headed and utterly lonely. Okay, me again. If an object could only be at one place in one time, well, so much for that tried and true thesis uh, after Aomami finishes her job, her hit job. Um, she's, a, she's, a, she's a hit person, a hit woman. Um, and she took out a one Mr. Miyama who's now slumped dead over his desk. And here's what she says and thinks to herself. She could hear her heart beating. And in her head, in time with the beat, resounded the opening fanfare of Janacek's Sinfonietta. Of Janacek's Sinfonietta. Soft, silent breezes played across the green meadows of Bohemia. She was aware that she had become split in two. Half of her continued to press the dead man's neck with utter coolness. The other half was filled with fear. She wanted to drop everything and get out of this room now. I am here, but I'm not here. I'm in two places at once. It goes against Einstein's theorem, but what the hell? Call it the Zen of the killer. So she becomes displaced and transported by music or music in her head, taking her to the green meadows of Bohemia. And in this cut, it, this take from one kind of self-presencing to another, we are presented with a narrative necessity or some unknown historical necessity to characterize one's position in the world this way. Indeed, to personify it in such a fashion that the paradoxes of place become the conflicts and hesitations of a character itself. I mean, just the point. I mean, you just murdered this man, and you're talking about Einstein's theorem and the fact that you're in two places at one time. Again, I just wanted to ask the stupid question. Who does that? I mean, honestly. However, I think there's a better contemporary novel that expresses the singular theme of being in two places at once, and that is the acclaimed book by China Mievo called The City and the City. I mean, you can just hear the title is already kind of ganging up on it. The City and the City, oh God. Well, this is the double or penology, okay? Um, the, 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 the doubled study of the city. So no plot summary here. Uh, let me just tell you about this strange place. The City and the City is set in the space of two cities somewhere along the coasts of the Black Sea that have two different cultures, two languages, two architectural styles, two cuisines, and two sartorial habits. One is Bejel, 
a uh, rather depleted city, and the other is the hyper-affluent gleaming glass city of Ulcoma that's seeing rapid development, yet is rich in archaeological history. Both very different cities are in the exact same place, like, like really, that's the point of the novel, comprising one urban location, two things in one space, but for the fact that the inhabitants are compelled by custom and by police forces to see their own city and to unsee the other city right before their very eyes. Practically speaking, this means at one corner, you're in one city, you step off the curb and you're in another city, this building is in one city, the next one is in another, every demarcation is a border, and sometimes the borders themselves are cross hatchings, where you are now in two cities at the same time, here on the sidewalk, over there in the vestibule. Like you literally have to, you're always computing where you are. And who goes about an urban space like that? Well, yes, sometimes, but the constant thought of where am I? Where am I? Where am that? Where am I? Gives a very different sense to the idea of being there or just to the idea of being at all. Okay. It's a strange place. That's because the separation between the two cities is mostly phenomenological rather than physical, but it's that too, of course. You are only permitted to see your own city, and while you move through space, you have to actively unsee the other city and its citizens. You have to unhear its sounds and unsmell its smells. Can you unsmell? I mean, that's why they say once you ring the bell, that's it, right? And, you know, there's... I won't talk about smell for, uh, mercifully, right? Um, it's a sort of awareness without acknowledgement, observing without noticing, and performance of inattention. You know the whole performance of not looking, just when you see a, a person you don't want to talk to on the street. Have you ever, you know, like I do it all the time at my job when I see a colleague and it's like, oh, you know, and I'm, I perform unseeing. It's a fun thing. <laughs> it gets me to where I'm going. Um, <laughs> I want to give you a, a paragraph here that is that is really really interesting, and I think it's on. It, it begins that evening. Ashil, okay, number seven. Thank you. Um, so yeah, to the text. I, I, here is what a construction like this. This is how you write being in the city in two places at once. That evening, Ashil walked with me in that both cities. <laughs> like you, there's, you just have to call up both cities. The sweep and curves of Ukoman Bizen. Tiri, a jut over and around the low Mittel continental and middle history brickwork of Bajel, its bas relief figures of scarfed women and bombardi um, bombardiers, Bajel's steamed food and dark breads fugging with the hot smells of Ulcoma, colors of light and cloth around gray basalt tones, sounds now both abrupt, schwa staccatoed, sinuous, and throaty swallowing. Being in both cities had gone from being in Bajel and Ulcoma to being in a third place that nowhere both that breach. Don't worry about the breach. Just look at the sentence. Like, what? Is, there's something wrong with this passage. This is the worst English I think I've ever read in my life. But I, th I think that is the point. This is the point. You can't even say it. I've practiced this passage many times. I still can't read it out loud. I have the rest of the paper memorized. So that's what it's like to be in two places at once in a world where you're already in two places at once. And this is how the very idea of place in the first place can accommodate the philosophical or logical paradox involving the non-contradiction of identity that when it comes to place, there's a place within place within place. That's what a place is. What's more, this is what it's like to write this contradiction into very chewy words. But to introduce another example of being in two places at once and to use another medium to, again, to extend the sort of inquiry from other kinds of representation, um, such a contradiction can be visualized um, as we see in the work of the artist and uh, curator uh, Shagayeg Siros, who facilitated and produced works that aspire to put artists and viewers in two places at the same time, no matter how far apart they are on the globe. So one piece is called A Window to Tehran, in which Tehran and San Francisco Bay Area 
are drawn together by showing the sunrise in the former Tehran while the same sun sets on location in the Embark Gallery in San Francisco. If you can follow what I'm saying here, it's hard to kind of visualize, but it's, it's quite an amazing um, um, idea. Um, Cyrus says that this that with this work she fought quote to get a sense of the compression of time space by using technologies unquote. There's a lot to say here, but for me, what's compelling about this work is that the natural indexing of time's flow, the sun setting into a time called night lasting hours, the sun rising to bring forth the long day, turns clock time into its true form, namely movement experienced now as the apparent magnitude of light changing across the skies in two places at once as the planet spins on its axis as a single and total globality in an effect that reduces the horizon once that ever mysterious vanishing point at the end of the earth over which the sailing galleon ship spills now into a knowable finitude, the horizon, no longer a figure for infinity, no longer for a figure for otherness, the horizon as after all, just another city, just another place. Skipping some passages because I heard my bell ring and I want to, you know, be merciful. Um, there's more. To, there's other works of art that are like that, and and kind of the point of some of this is to say why um, are artists doing this now? Like that's just the point. Like why why do you see it in novels? Why do you see it in, in video installations? Why do you see it in um, performances? Uh, why do you see it in in philosophical texts? I find that an interesting question, and I think it's this moment of, of now, very different from, you know, Aristotelian certainty. It's very different from certain uh, miracles across religions uh, of the world of bilocation, of seeing a saint or a mystic figure in two places at the same time. Very, very different. That's kind of a splitting. I'm talking about a synthesis, okay? So, lest we lose our theme of asymmetries, um, I quickly want to call to mind that passage portraying Tokyo, a passage whose elements were to take for granted in their surface composition, presented as pure appearance. So, let's take the case of cities themselves and take the case of any former colonial city. So, I'm now switching the frame and I'm going to a very, very different place. Take the so-called colonial architecture that survives in many post-colonial locations, okay? And what I hear I'm doing just to kind of give the thesis statement because I'm cutting paragraphs as I'm reading is the question of unseeing, like just, and re-seeing, okay? The strategies of, of really kind of, uh, um, I don't want to say reading the environment because that again reduces it to text. I want to talk about these kind of cognitive abilities um, that are uh, suited to spatial um, engagement. So a colonial city, take the so-called colonial architecture that survives in many uh, locations. Such colonial architectural style, and I'll get to an example here very uh, soon, uh, to the tourists can look colorful and charming in locations that are gussied up for spectators and travelers to come and enjoy themselves. But colonial constructions are truly a different kind of appearance. To put it bluntly, the appearance that is the architecture of terror and domination, especially the historic examples so many tourists visit in such places as Salvador City and Bahia, Brazil, with its administrative buildings. This seems to me like a problem of optics, of unseeing and then reseeing. When these structures were built, Indigenous people didn't look and don't look at these quaint seeming buildings in the same way the tourists do now. That is quite obvious, but it kind of is not at the same time uh, in tourist industries and in UNESCO. Uh, what do I, I don't want to use the word ideology. Is that too strong? Um, just uh, is that fine? I, I, thank you. And Nadia says it's okay, then it must be. Okay. Um, not to speak for anyone, unless we be reminded these buildings are impositions, military installations imposed by force on native people and their land. They are the old pine log stockades of the old American Western of a different style and material and in a different place. 
True, these buildings could have assumed any style if settlers other than the Portuguese landed on the coast of Brazil, but they'd still be colonial in their function. It just so happened that this particular colonial style is a hybrid of classical or Renaissance motifs that no matter how much tourists love it, monumentalizes violence and makes aesthetics out of politics and politics out of aesthetics before Walter Benjamin ever insisted of this conflation in the first place. That is why I find it strange when you go to the UNESCO website, uh, it celebrates Salvador City as, quote, the colonial city par excellence in the Brazilian Northeast, an eminent example of colonial Renaissance architecture. It's not just me, I hope, right? No, okay. That word, I mean, just that, that word colonial here, and apparently unproblematically reflects the theme, and I'm quoting here, the theme of world exploration. That is like, is, that's as real as it gets. The theme of just world exploration, <laughs> that, honestly. And the UNESCO website even describes a multicultural past. <laughs> Again, this kind of idea of different ethnicities getting together in this multicultural, like a Benetton ad or something that you see on a brochure. What? Rather than saying that all of this looks by virtue of its style and its infrastructure as a site of enslavement, suffering, murder, conquest, and disease. This is like a total disconnect, but more to that, I'm interested in like, how did we get to unseeing, right? That's the ideological problem. Of course, everyone wants to be happy on vacation, which is why nobody invites me with them when they go traveling, uh, when visiting such places and they don't want to dwell on human horrors. But they can at least realize that they are looking at architecture in the wrong way, and they must be told that. This is because to interpret the built environment requires intense acts of unseeing. We should regard the built environment wherever we are, not as a pure appearance or a seamless infrastructure that you negotiate unthinkingly as you drive on an elevated highway unaware of what's below or in your peripheral vision as you move through place. No, rather, and here I am speaking mostly to U.S. citizens in reflecting on the settler colonial state I call home, <laughs> that we should develop, you know, that we would do well to defamiliarize the built environment and look on it as a series of impositions like these, where everything seems out of place, where everything is estranged, where nothing belongs, where something as sure as day has been imposed on someone else, where sites of violence are underfoot or under tire. Okay, I'm gonna now give you the last section. It's on Franz Fanon. Uh, I kind of need to do it. Okay, can can we can you can we hang? Can we do it? Okay, all right, let's go. Right? Can you hear that? Did you hear that? Okay, good. Been practicing. These acts of unseeing, this concern with the sedimentation of history, finally, is one of the chief critical preoccupations of Franz Fanon whose engagement with dialectics was sustained over his entire writing career and ended with some powerful meditations on what a spatial material dialectic can look like in his book, Wretched of the Earth. Three pages into this work and Fanon is teaching us that you cannot talk about the colony or decolonization without talking about land, infrastructure, neighborhoods, and development, all the way up to what he calls major public works projects and nation building. He in short gives us the so-called infrastructural critique in post-colonial studies before it was ever named as such, as people are doing now, infrastructural critique. This is 1962. He was even doing it in 1952 in black skin, white masks. There are many important passages to choose from in Wretched of the Earth, but I would point to here to a few in closing in a gesture of exploring some of the more collective but practically utopian dimensions of a dialectic of space. To begin with, Fanon speaks of the built environment at some length and remarks that intentionally parrot, ventriloquize, utter the colonizer's voice speaking down to the colonized. He writes that, and here's one of the quotes. Um, I don't know what number this is, but it's 10. The colonized sector at eight. Okay, eight. The colonized sector or at least the quarters, the shantytown, the Medina, the reservation, is a disreputable place inhabited by disreputable people. 
Again, he's speaking from the perspective of the colonizer. Just wanted to put that out again. You are born anywhere, anyhow. You die anywhere from anything. It's a world with no space. People are piled one on top of the other. The shacks squeeze together tightly. The colonized sector is a famished sector, hungry for bread, meat, shoes, coal, and light. Our theme of the past sedimented into the built environment is here not yet visible, really, excluded for the terrible present of the colonized sector where there is no space, where the stacked sedimentation of history gives way to the inhumane verticality in the present, where people, as if dead or dying, are piled on top of one another, the shacks squeezed tightly together. Not even the Medina nor the Old Town is picked out for its historical significance, the deep histories of these places, in other words, because this history hasn't mattered yet. Though I have to admit that I secretly think that Fanon is referring to Le Corbusier's Plan Obus uh, of 1933. Do you know this one? Um, a plan for the city of Algiers, which included, among other things, leveling the Casbah and adding new residential units in which workers were stacked on top of each other in efficient buildings, uh, in addition to elevated highways and basically just bulldozing through the most deeply historical part of, of Algiers. At any rate, there is no sense of indigenous historicity because Fanon feels that indigenous pasts have themselves been colonized and sunk into the sediment by colonists and bourgeois intellectuals who hope that these traditions will remain inert, will stay in place, all the while fetishizing indigenous pasts as only a matter of style, of surface and veneer. Fanon writes, and here's the next quote, number nine. I can count now. <laughs> The culture with which the intellectual is preoccupied is very often nothing but an inventory of particularisms. Seeking to cling close to the people, he clings merely to a visible, visible veneer. This veneer, however, is merely a reflection of a dense subterranean life and perpetual renewal. Colonialism is not satisfied with snaring the people in its net or of draining the colonized brain of any form or substance. With a kind of perverted logic, it turns its attention to the past of the colonized people and distorts it, disfigures it, and destroys it. This effort to demean history prior to colonization today takes on a dialectical significance. So what is the so-called dialectical significance transpiring in Fanon's postulated today back then? It's that in decolonization, there is the aforementioned perpetual renewal. That is, that a certain dialectic is newly activated, whereby the arts are finally unfrozen and set in motion to take on new meanings to meet the revolutionary situation. Fanon writes, next quote, number 10, oral literature, tales, epics, and popular songs previously classified and frozen in time begin to change. Storytellers who recited inert episodes, episodes revive them and introduce increasingly fundamental changes. There are attempts to update battles and modernize the type of struggle the heroes' names and the weapons used. In artisanship, the congealed, petrified forms loosen up. Wood carving, for example, which turned out set faces and poses by the thousands start to diversify. The expressionless or tormented mask comes to life. The arms are raised upwards in a gesture of action. And I love the sense of coming to life here, of a revivification. Now, to be sure, Fanon, uh, uh, for Fanon, this praxis isn't only limited to art and what can be called representation in the fullest. And I simply have that passage because it's all forms of art. The multiplicity of media and representation itself is what you need. Um, it's not just one thing. It's not novels. Novels aren't going to do it. Not only poetry is going to do it. What's going to do it? Um, Praxis also involves a different kind of doing, and that for Fernand, that is nation building in a very real way, with attention to the construction of infrastructure and in what I find to be one of the most uh, compelling instances of the spatial dialectic in any work that I have seen. Um, Fanon says that, quote, during the period of nation building, every citizen must continue in his daily purpose to embrace the nation as a whole, to embody the constantly dialectical truth of the nation, unquote. So the nation and the dialectic kind of are going together. It's a kind of, a kind of nationalism that's interesting. 
And how is that done according to him, right? It, it's not through thinking and saying things. It's not through slogans. It's through building and doing so realistically and flexibly so that history can be made or better materialized at the hands and in the hands of the people. This is the last quote, and now we're really about to break through the tape and be done. But Fanon writes, if the building of a bridge does not enrich the consciousness of those working on it, then don't build the bridge and let the citizens continue to swim across the river or use a ferry. The bridge must not be pitchforked or foisted upon the social landscape by a deus ex machina, but on the contrary must be the product of the citizens' brains and muscles. And there's no doubt architects and engineers, foreigners for the most part, will probably be needed, but the local party leaders must see to it that the techniques seep into the desert of the citizens' brain so that the bridge in its entirety and in every detail can be integrated, redesigned, and reappropriated. The citizen must appropriate the bridge. So everything is here. You have the idea that there must no longer be any imposition on the land because that's exactly what colonial architecture already is, even though here that kind of architecture means social control. And there are books on architecture as social control as, you know. Um, instead, you have the practical role of architects and engineers who aren't highfalutin professionals swooping down on everyone to dictate what's what, which is the story of the invention of the discipline of architecture. <laughs> Rather, the theorists are coming to town, like, oh God, like, where's the exit, right? Um, rather, um, architects are constrained and engineers are uh, limited by local leaders to plan and design, not only in the interest of the citizens, but with their help, their gladly given labor. I find Fanon to be a great ending here in the sense that he is also a beginning, linking the ideas about what's sedimented in built environments as inherently contradictory spaces, inertial subterranean forces that have life and are, when we are mindful, resistant to our designs and flexible to our needs. The project going forward are the kinds of poiesis, the kinds of making that are praxis for the people who wish to build their worlds. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that tour de force. I didn't expect the road, but <laughs> it's, a... it, it, it's uh, yeah. So maybe I'll uh, we'll take some comments and questions from the audience before I kind of try to hog my yeah, no, <laughs> role here. Love but uh, any kind of yeah comments, questions, knee jerk reactions, <laughs> um, or elbow jerk. <laughs> <laughs> We're not just jerking knees anymore, but. Just go ahead, yeah. Or do you, yeah. Uh, for the people on a couple of things. Uh, uh, this is even worse. <laughs> now you really, yeah. <laughs> you see how I feel now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a couple of things. Thanks. It was incredibly productive, generative, uh, wonderful. Uh, one thing is, uh, uh, much of An uh, Anthony Shadid's memoir, yeah, uh, yeah. House of Stone, is is based on um, the concept of bait, which is both yeah. house and house home. And, yeah. and this is something that got short shrift, I think, in the conversation mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, uh, how problematic translation is, is that in containing these, I mean, we began to see it here, but, and you couldn't do everything, um, but uh, it's as if German and French provide these sort of concrete terms or whatever yeah, 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 that yeah, means yeah. something right. when in fact as soon as you shift and that's very much what that book's about right right it's one comment another that's comment right. is um uh is that uh uh, uh when i was at yale uh, uh, about 10 years ago and listening to humanities lectures mm -hmm. the um head of the uh, architecture school came and gave a lecture saying that architecture students could no longer draw. And um, so they were all using CAD, And but what was deeply problematic was that 
um, since they couldn't draw, they all envisioned within existing three dimensional space. So you wouldn't have like MC Escher type things that couldn't exist. But in the previous period, they had drawn such things and then tried to then create them in three dimensional space. So they were going back to teaching people how to draw because they didn't know how to, and uh, uh, they couldn't conceptualize beyond three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So that was something else that this provoked. And finally, um, uh, uh, I, I'm very fond of, of Salvador da Bahia, and I have yeah. been there several times. Um, I, it's, it, I, it is, uh, I, might, I would argue, very double-edged. On the one hand, even worse than you present in that the Pelorino, which is uh, where slaves are punished, is now the central place, it's like making the slave market into whatever. So it's absolutely grotesque. On the other hand, um, uh, two points. One is uh, I wrote extensively about Brazilian music. And uh, Nana Vasconcelos is from Pernambuco, the state above uh, 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 Bahia told me that he was an itinerant musician and that the terrible irony of Brazil and slavery was that he went to music school growing up, that all of these different rhythmic forms that he learned, he learned by going around. Um, and that there is this level of hybridization which had already existed in the Iberian Peninsula and then in Brazil. So this kind of dialectic, though, you know, whatever of power um, is not, you know, and the final thing is that it's probably the most interesting carnival in the world, Salvador, and the reason is it's completely participatory, right? Yeah. Um, it is yeah. as close yeah. to a heterotopia as you will ever see. There are, you know, black power drum corps, there are these Caribbean style bands, and then there are what are called affoches, which are um, like in New Orleans, uh, the, the sort of Afro-Caribbean uh, religions go out onto the street in secular form and they all meet each other, right? And on the final night, they meet um, actually overlooking this bay and there's a, a great white abolitionist poet whose statue is in the center, and they meet there and sing carnival songs yeah, all yeah, night. Yeah. Such a thing would be impossible. I don't want to act like it's a utopia, right. but yeah. I, I don't think that the dialectic of, of colonial power uh, begins to describe the complexity. Oh, that's great. And that's just such a rich, uh, comments. I'm very grateful for them. Um, let me uh, just, I uh, can address this in part. I mean, just going back to um, words and to philology and to the German English uh, lexicon, to the French lexicon, um, to the Arabic lexicon, um, I would say uh, that if I could uh, uh, sing along with you on your first point about bait, uh, home and house, um, is Martin Heidegger's essay on um, thinking, dwelling, building, it's or dw dwelling, building, thinking, or what's in some order like that. Um, Heidegger thinks that, um, <laughs> he, he says something like this, by giving the, the etymology of the word building, bauen in German, that he's going to get at some kind of original or primordial meaning that's authentic and that exactly affirms the thing that you're raising is the problem, that there's this kind of um, perhaps solidity or certainty in certain kind of languages where you, there might not be assumed uh, by the interpreter in these other languages, um, or at least that's what I was hearing. And, and But I wanted to say that in that same essay, and this is just to forget that Heidegger kind of makes up word histories. He's kind of like Isidore of Seville, like kind of makes up etymologies in his etymologies, but that Heidegger says that the uh, and he's saying this, you know, in the post-war period. He is saying this in the 1950s from a European perspective, okay? He's saying that the real housing crisis is the fact that we don't understand this word. It's not that there are countless thousands of homeless people, displaced people, war refugees in Europe 
It's that we don't know the dictionary well enough. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just like, that's what this kind of word reliance gives you. And so the thing that I want to say is that I, that, you know, as many languages that I can accumulate, you know, and I, and I hit the wall here because I was like, I don't know Arabic. I'm trying to walk around. I was saying, you know, I, I got lost in a place where like you're, you're literally like a kilometer from your hotel. How can you get lost? You know, you're, um, but, uh, you know, I, I felt, you know, when, when I was reading, you know, Mona uh, or remembering Mona uh, Fawaz's work, she was talking about like, you know, people who've lived here for a while can even get lost. So I felt a little bit better, but the point being is that I want to think that that on the one hand to think about etymologies and, and the various languages that gather around describing the built environment, but I also want to feel like that they can't gang up and surround it to even express it, that every word is going to have this doubleness, every word's going to have this distance, and that the problem of the ineffability of language to me isn't that of some problem like you see in ancient philosophy, like in Plotinus, right, where it's the it, language is ineffable because it can't capture the one that the angels, you know, are an infinite distance from God and that, that there's this, that problem of language is always spatialized already, that if we're talking about the ineffable where language fails, whether it's in Lacanian psychoanalysis or a fourth century Neoplatonism, it's always a spatial problem. And I find that interesting and I think it, I, I, I love, examples that kind of tell me that. So that, that would be the thing there. The thing about the CAD and teaching people to draw is just like absolutely amazing. It reminds me of the circulation of Euclid's elements in its early history, which is kind of like the invention of geometry out of the work of practical geometry. And when you look at the early manuscripts, what, it, what, what you find and when you uh, study Euclid, you're reading Euclid, you're reading words about pictures, like, like words about triangles, words about squares, you're not given drawings. And so like, there's a point where words about squares, words about triangles, words about trigonometric functions were enough. And that folks who are reading the stuff didn't need to visualize because they had a strong visual capacity to do so. And I am interested in, like the example of no one remembering cell phones or needing a GPS, I think your example of Yale is exactly about the atrophy of within a specialized discipline of, of a spatial practice, let's say. Uh, forget like, you know, mental uh, habits and all the rest. Um, and if you wanna talk about dimensionality, I think this moment of modernity is also marked by interesting developments within disciplines of architecture itself. Um, I think Escher is a wonderful example of, of visualizing spatial paradoxes, but, you know, we don't need to kind of explore or we do need to put that alongside, you know, the notion of, of irrational spaces in Lozitsky. Um, we need to put this alongside um, um, ideas about uh, space, you know, speaking of Einstein, right at the same time that mo Western modernism was trying to kind of mess with space and create spatial paradoxes, you have the notion of space-time as a fourth dimension and the problem that we have as three-dimensional beings trying to represent four-dimensional space. And the Tesseract, which is the great example of the four-dimensional space. If you've seen one, um, uh, you're amazing. Uh, if you can visualize one, you know, I will, I, I will celebrate you. What I mean is that only until the development of virtual reality technologies with the, with the stupid idiot Facebook headsets, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, you look like a damn idiot wearing this big thing walking around, but only with the virtual technologies can you now um, see in four dimensional space. And I can give you examples. There's a great video by Albert Huang um, on YouTube where he visualizes the Tesseract, but like, like where are those moments where we need uh, prosthetic, uh, prosthetics or te you know, technological prosthetics to kind of push our thinking farther in that way. And then finally, if I could just do, try one more thing, do I, am I still, do I still got you? Or do you want to stop? Well, you're not speaking of particular, but well, how do you, you can tell I'm from Georgia? <laughs> no, uh, you, it's, uh, it's something on your side. Okay, okay. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you got it, you got it. I was, 
can I say a thing about Georgia? <laughs> so yesterday I was walking around and, you know, I'm, I glow in the dark basically. And I was wearing a t-shirt, you know, and I looked like, uh, you know, Santa Claus, like walking around downtown and everyone was dressed for winter. Like everyone was like, oh, freezing. <laughs> and I was like, hmm. <laughs> and I was like, I, so, you know, I brought this coat to fit in, you know, like sort of like, oh, it's so cold. <laughs> So Georgia is hot, but it's not Mediterranean hot, you know, uh, and uh, that was interesting. But I live in New Jersey now, which is super cold. So I'm very, very acclimated. But that's funny that you noticed that. Yeah, I get the little twangs here and there. I'll leave the, the let's talk some more. Um, I'd love to hear more about your uh, perspectives. It's just amazing because the music thing is also super cool. Thank you for that. Who else wants to take a shot? <laughs> Maybe I can oh, I love quickly. Love yeah, uh, there's so much. I mean, I could. There's so much to, to, to kind of. You know, so so rich, and there's a lot to say. And of course, there's a lot in my head going around the question of topology and how to think about, you know, the whole whatever the whole Lacanian engagement with space and 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 that. But I don't think I'm going to ask about that. <laughs> I'm okay. just going to. Thank you. I'm actually going to. Um, I. I'm curious about your. You know, it's very interesting what you're doing in terms of. It sounds like. You know, it takes somewhat, or there's some kind of a Deleuzian problem in there that you kind of work your way out or with, through a Hegel in a very interesting way. And I'm just curious about, um, yeah, because I mean, it's almost like we could either either settle with this kind of the Deleuzian's kind of schizophrenia, as this is kind of almost the only place of, you know, this this kind of the doubleness in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. As a state, kind of as a as what kind of delimits all experience, but is the only way supposedly within kind of the capitalist. Yeah. Well, Deleuze doesn't really have an account of capitalism like that, but <laughs> it's almost like Good. saying in the face of that, um, why? You know, how has the uncanny or how has the feeling of estrangement become become kind of normalized? How has the uncanny stopped being, you know, this great thing that modernity introduces that makes us stop and think, right? How has the uncanny become, right, this kind of uh, uh, basically built into our environment in a right. way, right? right? And this is so I, I yeah, just that kind of a, and I. And I was wondering um, here. I mean, so you use this word, and I think you know, was it dop Doppler or uh, yeah, Doppel urbanology? Dop so. Yeah. 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 So there's, yeah. Sorry, no, but no, yeah, no, but there's no. almost like is it about almost kind of like you're saying that this kind of doubling, this feeling is of doubling, or this kind of experience of doubling is, is somewhat universal, right? But it's 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 still it's still we occupy it in different ways, right? Almost. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that that we should somehow be able to question <laughs> yeah. the, our capacity, kind of cognitively, yeah. uh, to kind yeah. of accept that, mm -hmm. normalize that. And then it's very interesting to kind of that, that you're opening up this question, whereas you have this entire kind of Deleuzean line where that kind of schizophrenic mode of being is the only possible way to be anyway. Like it's almost like it's it's, it's almost the site of resistance plus. Right, I mean, yeah. it's like the best thing you could almost do is the final end yes. end point, right? Yeah. So I'm. It's very interesting that you. I mean, it's great. I mean, be, I'd love to hear if you have anything to say about. Wow. This, yeah. No, I'm just taking some notes here and, and kind of mm. improvising as I go along. I mean, yeah. I mean, what you say about the un uncanny is what I would like to say about contradiction. Like, mm. like we've lost. Like contradiction's boring, you know. Oh, you're so contrary. You're such a contrarian. Like it's just boring, you know. I get. I, I, you know, I want consistency now, right? No, no. What I want is con contradiction to to sort of mean something. I think with the idea of the uncanny, if you know, and what is you know from again speaking of the translations, you no, know, it's it's something that's unhomely, mm -hmm. you know, translated from the German. So it's got like, like yeah, mm -hmm. right, right, right. So it is, um, you know, it, it signals, you know, and and there's all ways of reading this relationship to the emergence of the Gothic. The, um, uh, the 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 because the importance of dread that is uh, signaled in that essay during an experience of the uncanny. But what Freud also picks out in that essay, and which is the other thing that's forgotten, because you know people like to talk about the sublime, the uncanny, the this, the that, is that the uncanny is a fundamental displacement and disorientation. Mm -hmm. That's why it's unhomely. Mm -hmm. It's not unhomely because you don't smell. 
you know, mom was, you know, cooking, mm -hmm. you know, because you can't get it everything. You can't get, you can't get you what you want all the time. Right. Um, your pie and it, eat it. <laughs> it's that like this fear of dread produces dislocation. And when does, and that's something that one can work with by going to the other side of the thing where, where, when does fear and dread, when does dislocation itself, first of all, and displacement forced displacement produce you know, we don't want to call it uncanny because one doesn't want to be so clever in postmodernism, but certainly displacement and exile produces fear and dread. And, um, you know, an idea of like so many of these books, like the, going back to uh, Anthony, Tony's book, it's like um, on the stone house, how many books about um, um, displacement, migration, exile are have the theme of home in their title in and of itself and the port the importance of that the importance of returning to it you know i mean the best moments in bachelard's poetics of space to my mind are the moments of his reflecting on his childhood home where he remembers the way the stairs creak as he as he goes up them and the way the treads are set that like as a child you could really leap up the stairs in a certain way that space makes your body do things like when you're in a space you have to use it in a certain way right um you know like when i saw you when we we're leaving the restaurant i almost fell down the stairs uh which you know <laughs> it was just for comedic you know uh <laughs> relief or something but i was like okay I, I, that's not how you use the stairs the stairs will make you use them a certain way you have no choice right mm. um so what i what i'm wanting to say is that to bring the uncanny back is you know it's not it's not about estrangement we've connected the uncanny with estrangement too much it's about uncanny and the question of place that's where it matters that's where it's lost in translation um you know the uh, there was something i don't know if i if i can remember it now but the the, the general comment on schizophrenia reminds me it really makes me want to ask the question, you know, back to you in your own work. Like we were talking about your writing, your piece in Eflux and, and the idea of um, like, you know, capitalism and schizophrenia or uh, a, 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 a city, a place and a mental attitude, uh, starting with like just generalities of like, you know, Parisians are this way. New Yorkers are that way, you know, the general kind of vibe that a city has. Okay, we have that level of it, but more deep. You know, is the consideration of is like, are we going to like, is schizophrenia the, you know, the word? I mean, no, I, I wouldn't think so. Yeah, that's what that's that, that's that's what I'm asking. And yeah. I, I would rather hear you because of your clinical expertise and your disciplinary focus. Um, I don't think schizophrenia is the word. And I think that schizophrenia in that splitting is a Deleuzean refusal of dialectics. Now I have a whole little song and dance about Deleuze and Hegel mm. and try to make it secretly dialectical and there's things that you can do and it's boring anyway, but just, but I think that that split is creating a kind of um, something that even Fanon would want to resist and call a kind of uh, manichaeism, a kind of like mm. a absolute opposition mm. in the subject, but in his case, in you know, in the built environment is where he sees oppositions. Did you have something? Yeah. Can can we do a flow yeah, yeah. here? No, this the, no, that was yeah. yeah thank okay, thanks. Thank yeah. Yeah. Person that looks like a pig. Uh, that's how I started the question. <laughs> I, um, yeah, he's not talking about me. No. <laughs> True as it may be. Uh. But yeah, so um, you get these, and that that's one thing. So um, one way that you could understand his description of Bacon's paintings is that he's trying to show that uh, any individual substantial existing thing uh, is on uh, undetermined it could it could emerge within a different system of references but it, there's another way to look at Deleuze's interpretation of Bacon is that he's just imposing the human and animal dichotomy also oh, like here this is a pig man and right, and, right. and you know in a sense that just makes Bacon's paintings really boring because it's just reimposing dichotomies uh, so I think uh, that 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 that's the thing with those, but um, 
I like Deleuze though. Deleuze is cool. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna. I'm uh, not gonna be a hater. Don't worry. It's I don't. okay with Deleuze. <laughs> uh, but then uh, that what I I, I like the stuff about uh, palimpsests that yeah. you were talking about um, because I I thought that all of the things that you were saying were analogous to each other, um, but I felt that the palimpsest is a little bit different because when you when you think about Fanon, for example, talking about um, a colonial city erasing uh, thing, you know, there's violence there, yeah. and and then you can uh, reinterpret the narrative with more violence, and that's kind of what the whole book is about, just more violence. Yeah. Uh, but a palimpsest, that's a very calm, and you know, that's like a, monks are looking at these texts, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and the texts aren't fighting with each other; they're all present together, yeah. and and it's just a nice yeah. tapestry. And um, I guess I'm asking; I didn't understand yeah. what you wanted to do with good that because it good seemed point. a lot more peaceful than everything else that was going on. No, in, in your <laughs> goodness gracious! If you can make a palimpsest violent, uh, that's yeah. uh, I'm asking for Wait, that. Let yeah. me write that down. Make the palimpsest. Make the palms a little more violent. You know, <laughs> um, you know, that's a great question. I was trying to, you know, so first of all, just taking it from the top, I have a thing about the textualization of space. And that's because in the discipline of architecture, you know, there's this long history from the 1920s to Charles Jenks's work uh, called, you know, about the language of architecture. Um, and that alongside that goes along with kind of theorizing architecture. You know, um, you know, at 1 point, it was Deleuze's, um, fold, uh, the plea, you know, kind of. So now, like, in the mode of Frank Gehry, we're crumbling papers and making literal folds as the skins of the structures themselves and then kind of reverse engine, like, and so make that a structure, you know, like, I wad up a piece of paper and like, okay, build that, you know, and it's just like, everyone gets together, get on the CAD, you know, use a computer. You got your, you know, and we have Frank Gehry architecture on my campus and it's like shit. It's like, it like has total because I, I was in construction. So I've, I'm working on my 3rd house and like, and I'm like, the thing I freak out most is water. Like, you don't want water going into your foundations. You don't want water flowing overflowing in your gutters and, and, and flowing down your walls. And I look at the Frank Gehry thing and you should see what it looks like on campus. And I pointed out to a student of architecture who was in one of my classes, because I teach in the architecture school too. And, and, and he was, uh, he was like, oh, I didn't notice that he, they, they had to. Um, retrofit gutters on the architecture library because it didn't have any and, and it looks like a contraption out of some kind of like cyberpunk novel, like something, something that was just like, like a kind of Charlie and the chocolate factory sort of like, you know, shoots and ladders and, and it was like the, and it just ruins it. And I'm like, there you go. And it's not like I'm a, you know, a function over form kind of guy. No, I, want, I like it to be crazy. You can get it. You can tell, right? Um, I like it a little crazy, but I also like good design and I hate water when it's coming into my foundations. And so that's what they had to do. And then we built another thing on campus and there's all kinds of, of efflorescence, which is when the salts uh, sort of are leach out of this, the mortar and run down the side of the building as if someone like threw, you know, uh, vanilla ice cream at the side of the wall and it just went and, and it splatted down. Um, okay, so that's my whole thing about that's what the language of architecture gets you. That's what um, uh, the theorization incorporating, you know, of, of like theorizing architecture and 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 now there's whole now there's like object oriented ontology architecture, which I'm just like, it just never ends, but that's the trend that, that, that architecture has always wanted to have a relationship to theory, even at its inception in modernity in like the building of the Milan Cathedral, for instance, in the, in the European context. So that's what that gets you. And I was trying to say, okay, all right. So I'm like, take a deep breath, palimpsest. And, I, and as a medievalist, as, as was explained, I was thinking, Okay, is there any do I is there anything that this guy likes? You know, do you know do like because everyone says like in, in my classes it's like Andrew hates language, <laughs> and it's like well I mean I, I, that's a little strong, but so I'm like okay palimpsest. It was like the compromise thing, but I was trying to get a little. Didn't you hear the violence of how you have to erase? Like to make a palimpsest, man, you got to dig in. You got to take a knife. You have to take a chisel. You have to use force to produce it. 
as in palimpsest, but you're right that they are kind of calm, you know, that they are not scenes of violence like you see in Fanon. But I was looking for a language practice that was like material because I have this very naive view and I, and I get it from a critique of Althusser, which he's where in where he has this uh, quotation um, that uh, like that the, by, that by materialism what we mean here is something something Marx's and Engels's materialist conception of history. What we don't mean is a brick, right? And he's writing this in 1968, and you can't talk about bricks and paving stones in Paris in 1968, and we know why because those were the things that the students were scuffing up. Grabbing and throwing at the, at, at, you know, at the police, um, and I find that a very, very, you know, and also he says rifle. By the way, not I'm thinking it's like it's neither a brick nor a rifle, and these like revolutionary metaphors are kind of like a. We're talking about something different. That's like that's materialism with an asterisk is how I would like to think about. It. So I was looking for things where, you know, in this naive way where we have like a thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's an object that's a brick or a gun or a stone or a piece of sheepskin that has language on it. And that where, you know, and that the problem of language isn't just the problem of the language of architecture from the point of view of design or the language of architecture from the point of sacred practices that you see in many sacred spaces where there is writing on the temple walls. Many religions have this. Um, and even this like a curious fact, the idea of like a building as having, you know, multiple stories, like a two story building, a three story building. We get the word story from uh, the Latin historia or story that on the first floor is where you see written text in European buildings. So we think of the built structure from a language practice in and of itself. I want to break those things apart. Um, and so, you know, what I will keep in mind, though, is I have you, you have to tell me who you are, because I have you down as red sweater. Um, but like, I want to know, okay, no, you're red sweater. Okay, red sweater um, is professor red sweater or whoever, um, you know. Uh, okay, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, that, um, that, um, I, I'm, I'll, rack, I'll, I'll, I'll do what you say. I'll make it. I'll, I'll give it a little bit. No, I'm doing it. No, you said it. It's going to happen. I'm, there's no, no, no going back now. You know. There's a question. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What I meant by if you can make is just I don't see the contradiction in a palimpsest. Is that's you have know. you ever worked with a palimpsest? It just looks like a mess, right? It yeah. Looks, well, it, I, yeah. again, I have worked. I you know, I probably have like skin cancer from working with palimpsests because you recover the erased ink material with ultraviolet light. And so I'm like, you know, and, and it's a, kind of a pain in the neck. And it's also like, you know, there are other processes that you can use with more expensive equipment. Um, but, it, I, it, but yeah, I'm doing that in a library, you know, um, and it's, 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 it, it's part of my archaism, I, I would have to admit. Like, it's part of my own fetishism of the past and wanting the past to be something. And this is, I'm taking the sentence out of my paper, but like the past as not like ideas, mm -hmm. like to see the built environment as where history really matters in both senses of the term. Boom, end of story. That, like, I want to get there. And, you know, and I, and if you see ways of doing it, that mm -hmm. the palimpsest isn't strong enough, but it was like the only language thing that I could think of that really did it. It's a great question. I love talking about it. So thank you, my friend. It's in the back. Yeah. Razal, I, or so whoever. Yeah, the, sorry, sorry. You know, the architect. And the, the architect. <laughs> oh, she, all right. Thank you, everybody. Let's that, that waiting for her question. That concludes this session. <laughs> we can't have. I won't, I won't bring any excuses for my discipline. Oh. No, no, I won't bring any excuses definitely for Frank Gehry, nor would I okay, okay. defend the creation of meaning, Charles Jang's, all of, all, all of that, all okay, of I'm that. I'm liking I the questions so far. In, in fact, there, there are no questions. In fact, I wish you would give this uh, lecture, re-deliver it again to our department. Um, God, I would love to do that. Yes. Well, I, I, we tried. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think I indicated I was going to do architecture either. I, that, that's, that's. Oh, you did. Okay. Yes. Oh yes. I, yeah, I well, mean, it's, just, it's, it's been a, it's been a difficult week in, in, in the university. Yeah, it has been. Uh, but look, I just, first of all, I just 
wanted to thank you for for the lecture. I would say that we're kind of we're more comfortable with multiplicity at the moment than the kind of questions of asymmetry. Uh, and all of that is thanks to Deleuze and all of those good people. But, but I also wanted to point out that we're, we're, we're less troubled by the whole kind of conversation of CAD and this relationship of hand to mind and spatial practices and that kind of thing in that. And I'm not, again, I'm not defending this. I'm just saying this is where we are is, is we're more focused on process driven uh, form making and less so space making, uh, which. You know, there is a distinction there. That's great. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Now keep going. That, that. <laughs> you have to keep talking. I'm sorry, but you're 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 not done. Please. <laughs> I think I, I'll I'll stop here and I'll pass. Oh, it. Okay, then I'll see. Okay, yeah. perfect. Form making. Uh, yeah, the architect that I was pointing out the gutters to is the founder of a um, architectural firm called Form Finder. Like. Oh. Uh, and, and you can Google him, and he's like a he was like an editor at Art Forum, and really kind of a significant. I mean, he, it's weird because he's what, like what's his name? Uh, Julian Rose, and and okay. I've collaborated with him on stuff, and did an interview between like an architect and whatever this thing is. Um, you know, but uh, it is a thing, and I just wanted to say the reason why I say that is because well, first of all, Julian is we are collaborators, co-conspirators, so he's. Like on board with kind of what we're saying, even though I'm going to have to give them hell for form finder. This is this is thank you for that. <laughs> um, but to say that form in the human, it's a bigger thing. Not that architecture is the humanities, but if you go into the humanities, it's like it's all about form still, right? You, do, 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 somebody back me up. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have we have one. We have a second in motion. Like that's all I hear about now. Yes, it's coming back somehow. Exactly. Yeah. No. And it, but it's always been along. It's been around. I mean, I wrote about this uh, bubble blah, but like, you know, this the formalism is super duper old. It does. It's not just with like. That's what I mean. It's. it's yeah. I, I consider that old. Um, right. Right. But you have to read for form now. You know, you can't. And that's what I was getting at with the surface and depth thing that like surface is the is kind of the formal properties of a literary text. And then the depth is just your stupid Marxist interpretation and what you project onto it. Right. Yeah. Um, and I want to say that, like, it's not they, they aren't different substances, really, you know, um, and I don't know. I mean, we can get into questions about pro properties and objects, but just like I, I, I don't. Agree with that idea of so form is what I mean to say is that see is happening. It, it's that you know people are doing you know and and even like in architecture like deconstruction uh, and de you know arch that, that 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 whole movement has. A is that right? Yeah. You you, you sound like my brother. Um. <laughs> Like, are you going to share the ice cream? No, no. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> amazing. It's amazing. That's right. That's true. Yeah. 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 You'd have to tell me what that angle is. I mean, can you? I mean, not not here, but is is one able to say? Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. I just don't see how. For me, uh, can I explain? Like, as a theorist, like I'm the. I was I was joking with you. I used to be a young person. Like I used to be like 18 years old and reading Hegel. Now I'm like this what I, <laughs> you know and and um so I was kind of raised on this stuff and always doing this sort of work. Where I felt like I was finally theorizing again was when I started involving myself in construction. It's not architecture, but it's also it's like the old conflict between 
I mean, to go back to the building of the Milan Cathedral between the, the architects that fly in from England and from Germany to advise on the construction of the uh, cathedral and the stonemasons who have practical knowledge of what it means to kind of like deal with, um, you know, um, uh, uh, loads and forces and, and things of that sort, uh, which is kind of an interesting moment of a distinction between theory and practice, I, I find. And I found that thinking about the gutters on the Frank Gehry, you know, library at my university, um, or thinking about the things I'm working on now and the other projects I've done in the past, that to me feels like it, it it feels like theorizing. It, it, I, I don't know really how else to say it because I'm the one who wants to, like, I love, like, just to kind of abstract it and be more academic and less kind of autobiographical. Like, just thinking about, um, like, uh, you know, just the ways in which uh, trigonometry comes out of, like, Babylonian construction practices or, or the same kind of thing with geometry. Um, you know, and there's versions of this that you can read about uh, in Marx, uh, frankly, um, and in um, and Husserl to some extent, but just thinking about geometry as a kind of as an abstraction of that practical building, you know, and there's architecture in there somewhere. But to me, it's a confusion of theory and praxis, and that's what I want. And that's why I actually use the word poesis as what splits the difference. Because, you know, because there's too much, you know, theory and, 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 and praxis, and I think that poesis as a form of making is already a form of, like, theorizing and doing, and it kind of brings things together, and it's also kind of an artful term, you know. Um, so, anyway, this is fun. Thank you. Thank you. You're in control. We still have I, I can do this as long as you want. Okay. Can you, there was Abdullah and... Um, Abdullah and... Tom, no, but there's also Philip. <laughs> so... Do you want to, Philip? Do you want to go? No, Philip, you you two are first, I think, right? Or no, just go. No, no, Philip, you go ahead. Sorry, it's okay. He has the mic. If Rami says to go, I'll go. Yeah, yeah. No, he has the thing. He, <laughs> it's like Lord of the Flies. You have the conch, and so you have to speak. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I also, of course, enjoyed the talk a lot. Uh, there was, I think, one or two mentions of. Um, let's say something like uh, the nation or maybe even a national situation. And so I was hoping you might speak uh, or kind of think out loud w about uh, an idea, which of course is not my idea. And I think you can probably guess whose idea it is. Yes. That has to do with kind of being inserted into multiple levels of struggle and maybe thinking about those, that kind of insertion in terms of, you know, you kind of are in one national situation, which of course, is a, a site of uh, a space, let's say, um, has kind of a space of asymmetry, mm -hmm. which is also yeah. in a broader um, kind of, let's say, yeah, a broader kind of space of asymmetry, which you are also, uh, you know, in, uh, yeah. unfortunately. Right. You know, for, yeah. For yeah, I thought purposes. you were going to say Benedict um, Anderson, Perry Anderson's brother. Ah. So I was thinking of, of a nation in terms of a magic community. Who? Ah. Who are you thinking? So I, I'm just thinking about the commentary in um, Allegory and Ideology. Oh, yeah. Oh, a certain on the someone. third world literature essay, yeah. Yeah, I think I have an idea who you mean. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess what I'm thinking, I'm thinking about also is that we're dealing with you know, literary texts from different parts of the world, which yeah. are very yeah. enlightening. Right. Um, but it also, I guess, um, for someone who's interested in doing this kind of work, it's very helpful to, for me to hear you think about, um, yeah, this tie between, uh, let's say, historical situation or historical necessity and, um, and things like, you know, character. Yeah. Oh, and things like character. I wasn't expecting that. Say, what, what, how did you get to character? Like, character, like, because I thought you were going to say, like, in the individual within society, but character. Oh, I guess I understood, you know, the, the, um, the examples um, that we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. To uh, okay, character is, of course, one of the things that that's you know something we can talk about. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Also, maybe something like I don't know, right. point of view, or as a kind of historically specific um, form. Or, you know, there are kind of historically specific forms that we talk about in terms of point of view. Yep, yep. And then, of course, it's also very interesting to me to think about. Let's say, okay, there's Nigerian literature from a specific situation within Nigeria, as opposed to another. Mm -hmm. You know, in Lebanon, of course, just yeah. the same, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, so just taking it back, the, you know, um, it's called allegory and ideology, which I say that because the original version of that book by Frederick Jameson was called the allegorical symptom. Um, and, you know, I, and I, you know, there's, there's a lot of alternative titles to his books that I don't know if it's widely known, you know, but anyway, that's one of them that I, that's what it was called when I was reading it in manuscript. And, and I find that in a, almost a more interesting, like, kind of provocative in a different way. Um, one is that, you know, Fred is recovering. He, like, he is, he includes, like, when he published his word, um, his essay on, uh, Third world literature. You can Google whatever. I forget what the title was. Something, something. Yeah, third world. No, I don't know. If it, well, something, something. Third world literature. You know. And oh, okay. Well, who am I talking to you about? Yeah, it's, I feel like this is a setup. I'm, I'm, I, like, talk to Philip, right? Because he's gonna like, he's gonna. <laughs> yeah, I see how it is. Um, but, but, but it, that that essay was. Very much reviled, right? And now it's made a kind of a comeback in a way where scholars in various national literatures are saying, "Wait a minute, there's something in to that," including people like Simon Gikandi. You know, I mean, there's there are kind of, and there, you know, it's a question of genre too, and the notion of genre and nation thinking as national as a generic question of, of national romance or national tragedy. A, a lot of kind of post-colonial African literatures. Uh, figure the nation in generic terms as either romance or tragedy. So you have that kind of articulation. Um, but the interesting thing is the kind of literary angle, which includes the allegorical, but with the difference that the allegorical um, is, um, and I think the allegorical symptom gets to this. Um, and there's, but very, very, you know, in the long history of the reception of allegory, before there was ever a Fred Jameson, was the idea that it was one of the kind of architectures of thought. And that allegory was probably most expressed in the construction of, well, frankly, of, 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 of mosques and cathedrals themselves, like just the insane or beautiful, I mean, depending on your perspective, patterns that you, that can be um, revealed and, you know, um, and with kind of significations and meanings that aren't evident to the eye, but only there when you render the built space into a figurative drawing, right? And so allegory is to me, and I think that in Jameson's thought isn't spatialized enough, but it is to say to conceive of a national space in allegorical terms, which are architectural terms, which are the terms of the built environment. And so, you know, that might have been a thing he should have said when publishing the essay versus saying, you know, third world literature is just all about the birth of the nation, which is in my country, that's like a if you know what that is, that's just like a shitty racist, you know, film from the early 20th century. But it's just to say that it's fetishizing the, the nation as a kind of heroic structure, also as an impossible structure. But to me, the allegorical problem and the problem of allegorical is absolutely architectural. And it's a very close, you know, small step towards building the bridge um and and the architectural critique so that that would be i you know and 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 it's also the reason why i like allegorical symptom is because um versus al because like you need it to be called allegorical symptom because when you say the word allegory you lose people right yeah like like al like and you're probably like when are we going to stop talking about allegory right but it's like what the fuck is allegory anyway sorry but just like you know wh whereas <laughs> like who cares um and and in jameson's political unconscious very, very fundamental foundational text, it, 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 you know, in literary, it transformed not just literary criticism, but many disciplines. If you Google uh, something, something unconscious, like, it, you know, there's the architectural unconscious, there's the, you know, all, that, that, that book was a sensation across disciplines, and it's founded on an allegorical mode of interpretation based on Henri Lubach you know, book on biblical exegesis, which, which is the weirdest thing. But again, just to take it back, allegorical symptom is useful because um, thinking is allegorical. It's not that allegory matters, it's that allegory as it like is later kind of emerges in Benjamin is an act of bringing disparate entities together. It's a innately dialectical process of collecting and juxtaposition. You know, it feels like it's not animated because it's kind of the stuff of museums and encyclopedias, monks and et cetera, right? But, but 
if you're doing uh, Fred's gambit in political unconscious is that if you're doing allegory, you're kind of doing dialectics and you're ready for, you know, the full program of dialectics, you know, like you're ready for the next level of katas or something in your training. Right. Um, and so that, that, but again, the spatiality of it is completely lost and it matters. I don't know if that is at all, you know, yeah, yeah. Do you have a specific national situation in mind? It's hard for me to think of national situations as, you know, as an abstraction. Oh, yes, 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 yeah. I see there that, yeah, that, that sounds, oh, okay, okay, I get it. Yeah, no, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I flew 5,000 miles here <laughs> to tell you what I'm doing. Uh, it's, it's to you I must apologize. <laughs> you know, it's like to, um... Okay. Okay, a little, a little weird. Um, I, that, well, that was I was going to use. Well, thank you for that, because I was going to talk about Charleston, South Carolina, and their and their slave stone where, you know, yeah, you, you have that monument. That's the, the right with your example. I was going to be like Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah. Well, see, then boom. Right. Um, but no, though, the, the, those characters to me or those authors, um, it, it, here's the order of my thinking here. I believe that the novel is a is a registration device for space, right? It, it, it and we, there's a lot of things that you can say, but that's what I think. You know, could be wrong or dumb. That's what I think. Um, then I think that there's a genre of that called the city novel, where the I believe in this thing. Like I'm not a death of the author kind of guy. Um, I believe in. It sounds stupid to say, but you know, time is short, so let me just say the dumb stuff. Um, I believe in authorial intention. I believe that there's a genre called city novels. And I think that when the city novel is kind of like written by authors who like Mirakami and uh, Teju Cole are aware of globalization, the global space, the hyperspace of late capitalism, like they're kind of already involved in theorization in itself. I mean, especially in Teju Cole's work. I mean, he's he talks about this weird thing, Pierce Plowman even, which was like crazy. Like nobody talks about Pierce Plowman. Yeah, except me, but he was like a 14th century radical, so I like him, you know. Um, and and peasants read his poem in medieval England and then re and revolted. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, so yeah, so. But it, it you know, novel as novel as registration device, um, authors that intend to write city novels, Tokyo, New York. That to me is kind of like an, an effort to under to grasp totality that can be named not first as capitalism or global capitalism as Jameson does, but I think first as the city as a global city or world city as they're called, right? I believe that the world city is the unthinkable thing. And in fact, I would say that location is, is like, where does the problem begin? You know, I mean, if you're like Hegel and you're reading the phenomenology of spirit, you can't even think the thing in front of your face. You know, there's no certainty about, you know, of sense certainty about, you know, the salt on the table or the house that's behind you that has a tree, right? Architectural metaphor again, right? And it's a house that just like, you know, it kind of blows apart in the wind in a very kind of silent, quiet way. Like you don't know it's a house until retrospectively until the end. But that, that that's just kind of why I'm getting, I'm picking these different authors. And it's also because, oh, frankly, I should admit this first, but like, I like these works. Like I, I don't talk about stuff I hate. <laughs> Or like I used to write a lot about stuff I hate and I'm tired of it. Like I, I want to get into things I like, you know, is that fair? Yeah, yeah. but thank you for that, Tim Bill. It's nice, nice meeting you. Coming to the end, we have two more questions. Are you? I, I told you that I, what did I say to, uh, what did I say, Rami? What, that, could... that I can go on forever, which is only, a, I, look, it's 730. <laughs> yeah. Man. I can keep going, but if people want to leave, they should leave. I don't want anyone to stay that they don't want to stay. Like, you know, if you want to, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I like your sweater is why I keep looking at you. 
I'm like, where can I get one of those? You know, I, I just like. Just... Yeah, we'll take two more. Yeah. yeah, my thing is. I'll do whatever you say. You're in charge. Yeah, yeah my... that makes me kind of talk. I want to see him get through my thoughts. Okay. Uh, my thing is quick. Um, the palimpsest, I understand, is like a historical material object. I think in contemporary times, the like city wall with this graffiti on it as like a modern palimpsest where yep. you have this um, sort of continual rewriting of identity and place and like, you know, claiming of space and that erasure is it's not you're not rubbing something away, but rather layering over again to erase mm, in order to like add to it. Um, I just I kept thinking about this, so I kind of wanted to like, what do you think about that? And then, you know, that's it. Okay. Um, yes, in fact, I have like, so there's the, you, the, the utopian dimensions of this that are extended in the book that's I'm, I'm finishing this big ass book and um, I'm not telling you what the title is. Uh, it, it'll have to be a surprise. And what I was saying again about the authors that are local that had influenced me, a lot of that comes in, um, in the epilogue, but one of the things that, um, in, in the third volume that's more in, in the character of a manifesto is exactly, uh, I love graffiti, I love street art. I, I don't call it graffiti, I call it street art, um, as you did. And um, I think that, you know, the, the positive projects that I have seen in multiple cities where I have lived, and I live very close to Trenton, I don't live in Trenton, but cities where, um, uh, you know, you could call it public works. I guess you could call it public art, but it is to, it is to, um, let me put it this way if I can. Like, you ever see like a stupid Michael Bay movie, like Transformers, like these awful, and you, and you, and you, you finish the movie, which is like a miracle, and you sit through the credits, and there's like thousands and thousands of people working on this dumb, stupid movie, right? Like, so on the one hand, it's like the kind of um, it's it's like very you know Ernst Bloch in the sense of like in capitalism there are utopian dimensions and in in capitalist cinema let's just call it that because that's what it is it's very kind of like you know it's kind of like a form of Reaganism still that you know um, you know that you know what you see here is that an artwork can employ ten thousand people like you know and I am captivated by that and I think that like. Um, city rejuvenation that includes street art, that in, in, includes uh, painting projects, which includes gardens, which includes repurposing the public library as a space um, of rest, as a, a, as a space for medical care, as a space for learning, not just internet and sleeping from the element, you know, like I, I see it in my country, but, but opening up and broadening the capacities of what a library can do, which is a kind of multi-purpose, like that, is where that, that's kind of where my thinking goes immediately. And I'll also say that, you know, when I, I was in uh, an interesting thing about graffiti, just the last thing that w when you visit uh, Mar um, Martinique um, uh, and you're in, in um, Fort de France, uh, where, you know, Fanon grew up, um, there is still active graffiti that says, you know, fun, like people spray paint Fanon's name all over the damn place. And it's just amazing, like that, 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 like he still, like his signature and presence is felt in that very environment. And so I have a bunch of photographs of that. Um, okay, who was the other one? Abdullah. Who was that guy? Or who, who, who are you? Tom. Tom, and then and before that? Philip. Philip, okay, good, Tom, Philip. Okay, thank you, uh, Yeah. So uh, the um, mentioning the Palimpsest, I, I was, it gave me kind of the idea as if kind of space or place is, is doing the work of the concept, it's kind of breathing through this writing, erasing and rewriting. But then I was, and then, you know, when you start speaking about material contradiction, you know, understanding place as material contradiction, kind of, I was thinking that it actually is, that's what it's doing, it's doing place as concept, yeah. something like that. Yeah. But then I was thinking that you proposed the strategy to kind of not think about uh, space temporally. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why, uh, because, it's, you know, you're speaking about history, you're speaking about, uh, right? And then uh, when you uh, uh, spoke about the commodity and the two bodies of the commodity, yeah, yeah, yeah. you uh, spoke about, I mean, exchange value. It, it, it seemed to me when you were uh, speaking like exchange value only through this kind of uh, temporal totality does is kind of this thing given its body, you know, right? Like, 
Uh, so, so why, if I followed you correctly, mm -hmm. why was there, stra there yeah. did you propose the strategy of not temporalizing? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I mean, if let me let me go with the small examples. Like the my thesis is the simultaneity. Like is simultaneity temporality? Like that's kind of the first thing. Um, and there's a lot we can say about defining a, a event, like what is even an event, what 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 is even simultaneity in um, philosophical terms. Uh, so there's that, and I don't think that simultaneity is a form of time. I, that, that's my thesis, and so I think that um, the commodity is simultaneously these two bodies, and there's not a temporal element where, okay, I'm taking this thing to the market, and I'll get there in two hours, and then now I'm here, now I'll take this and make it an exchange value, you know, like. It's not a story like that. It's already in capitalism that thing, all, it, the always already of a simultaneous. Okay, so there's there, there's that. Um, temporality. Here's my problem with it. It's that like I am we it um, it's it, it's um, I, it's it's a crutch. It's it's like it it or or let me say this way. We it, let me let me make it worse. <laughs> um, language. Time and temporality, um, narrative subjectivity, like all these things, kind of go together in some sort of way. You know, um, let me just—I can make the answer longer, but it just if you can accept that that we experience ourselves as linguistic beings sometimes, um, that what matters to us more is time. That in the history of philosophy, if you believe Henri Lefebvre and Edward Soja. Over the history of philosophy, something happened where philosophies of space were overtaken by philosophies of time. Boom. Well, yeah, and and so that's why, and so I'm kind of like, okay, what's that about? Well, you know, the Marxist in me, and that is me, says, well, that's you know, the introduction of labor time. I think there's a a, a, a vulgar teleology that you could say here that the invention of clocks taking over bells as signals at, at, of time, the invention of the portable clock, which is a 16th century invention and wristwatches and, and like we, we've been temporalized. And, and I will say that I'm very close to saying, uh, well, I, I'm saying two things. I'm saying space is ideology. You should have gotten that vibe. When, when a building makes you walk a certain way, when space is built as a form of social control, that's ideology, that's policing. I mean, the, it's a repressive state apparatus, not just an ideological state apparatus, you use Altus there. But I think time is ideological too. And we know that in labor time, of course, right? The notion of a weekend, the notion of work hours. But I think it's, um, you, know, uh, you know, ideological in a very, very kind of, in a sense that's, um, um, that feels the pressure of centuries at least in Western, at least in the European thinking that I know, that tells you that time is the element of subjectivity, is is you know um, the element of language, um, and that space is something that we kind of forgot to think about. So I'm just trying to kind of overturn the apple cart, you know, as like my grandfather would say, going back to Georgia, um, um, and to to say that like. It, 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 it's like a classroom exercise, you know, like, it's like, okay, everyone take a blindfold and I'm like, oh, fuck these things, these, you know, I hate, I hate participation, you know, like, you know, that's why I don't go to the theater. You're like, as soon as the actors come off the stage and start, you know, grabbing my hand, I want to leave. But it's like, it's, it's a thought experiment where it's like, you cannot do time, like stop doing time. And out of Hegel, this is the moment, you know, when, when we are to tarry with the negative, it is to stop, you know, and when we are to kind of like, you know, think these things that Sartre calls the arrested dialectic, when we're to think of the dialectic at a standstill in Benjamin, right? And we see versions of this in Jameson, they are telling us, well, on the one hand, they're like, oh, it's a bad thing that the dialectic is out of time, but I'm saying it's a good thing because that's a spatializing moment uh, that keeps us from temporalizing space and keeps us from thinking about space as a language. That's kind of why I'm kind of repeating what I said in the talk but it's but there's like there's a sinister, you know, there's a conspiracy here that's a conspiracy of one, <laughs> which is to say you can't have time. You only have to do space. You have to have one hand tied behind your back. Go. So. 
Yeah, and then see, we're out of time. Well, I'll be dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Th thank you so much, Andrew. This was Thanks so generous. So Thanks to everyone. Low clap, too. Oh, you're killing me. You're killing me. You're killing me. You're killing me.